Hi, I'm Meredith Marr at the University of Maryland Children's Hospital. I'm joined today by two experts in pediatric bedwetting, nurse practitioners Andrea French and Carmel McComsky. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. They're here from the Division of Pediatric Urology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. If you have any questions for us, please be sure to leave them in the comment section below and like this video if you're tuning in. Also a reminder to like our page if you haven't already. So Andrea, can you please explain to us what bedwetting is? Sure, I think it's really important that we start off by saying bedwetting can be a very normal part of childhood development. Most children will gain daytime dryness maybe by around three or four years of age and their nighttime dryness will fall into place several weeks to months after that, sometimes even years. We don't actually consider bedwetting abnormal until after the age of eight, and even then, some kids just take a little bit longer to gain dryness overnight. Um, really, if we didn't do anything for these kiddos, they end up drying up on their own. Um, less than 1% of children by the age of 18 are having bedwetting issues. Is there a typical age where you notice that bedwetting is more common, or does it vary? What age do you see it happening in most of the children? So, the phenomenon of bedwetting is, is a child who doesn't get dry, doesn't get dry at night. So um, bedwetting might be thought to be abnormal if you had a child who had been dry at night for many years and then all of a sudden started to have more increased wetting. Um, that might be a red flag that you would bring to the attention of your primary care provider. Um, but um, developmentally, some families who have had a, a family history of bedwetting um, might not recognize bedwetting to be a problem at all and might not ever seek to, to try to fix it. it. It's usually identified as a problem by the family when the, or the child when, the, when they've decided that they really want to do um, more aggressive intervention to try to end the bedwetting earlier. So bedwetting is hereditary? For sure. It is. Um, we know that family um, history is really an important part of the assessment, and many times um, families tell us um, that there is a significant history in the family tree. Lots of families don't really know their family history about bedwetting because in some cultures and in some families it's considered to be a little bit of a secret. So um, it's really easy. Um, when the family can say, my grandfather, my uncle, my cousin, um, and then it's, it's very validating for the child as well. Right. Um, often it's only one kid in, in, in a particular um, family. So if there are multiple siblings, it may be that only one child is sweating the bed? The, un the one unfortunate. Oh, yeah. So when would you say that bedwetting becomes a problem? At what point? I think that's really patient and family dependent. The bedwetting becomes an issue when it's an issue for the child or the family. A lot of times we'll see kids that come to us around the age where they want to go to sleepovers or they want to do summer camps and they just can't because they're too embarrassed that they're wet overnight and they need some, some guidance in helping to get rid of that. Um, like we said, it can be extremely normal. Some families are just so used to it from dealing with other family members that have had the same issue, but when it becomes a problem for the child or the family, that's when we're certainly able to help out. So you mentioned going to sleepovers. What can parents do to help um, support their child or make them feel like they're not abnormal, to feel less embarrassed if their friends find out that they're wetting the bed or if they're afraid to go to sleepovers or even during the day maybe playing sports or just playing with their friends and they happen to wet themselves because they're too excited and they don't want to leave the activity. How can parents help support them and make them feel better? So two different issues, right? So all kids have an accident occasionally during the day when they fail to stop to go to the bathroom or they don't get there in time or um, we like to call it the pee-pee dance. They're on their way to the bathroom and they didn't quite make it. Um, that's pretty normal. Uh, but when daytime, when kids start to have problems with daytime wet, wedding or daytime habit, that interferes with their nighttime as well. And so it's really important when they find their way to us to determine what the daytime habit looks like because it certainly influences the nighttime. And um, kids who wet at night don't get dry until their daytime habit is addressed. Um, but back to how do we support kids, um, I think it's really important. Some kids are pretty laid back and it doesn't really matter to them. They'll put a pull up in a sleeping bed, they'll slide in and out of it, they take care of the whole problem. And it, that's very dependent on the, the, te the uh, temperament of the child and the way in which the family in engages. But then there are other kids who are very protective and their families are protective. And so they often have never been allowed to go to sleep over. So that's when I think it's kind of an issue. Um, that it's interfering with normal growth, normal development, right? What are some things that parents can do um, to maybe help prevent the bedwetting, especially at night? 
Um, well, a lot of it depends on what's what's going on um, to cause it. Now, like we said, sometimes it's completely normal and there's really no fixes that we can help during the daytime habits with, that they're doing really well using the bathroom appropriately at night, I'm sorry, during the day. Um, but there are times when there are habits that we can help improve. Um, certainly we want to look at things like what their daytime bathroom habits are like. Constipation plays a really big role, um, making sure that the child has good bowel habits and bowel function. Um, one of the thing that we have to remember with our families is that we want everyone to remain positive around the issue, that this children aren't doing this on purpose, they're not being lazy, um, but we want to focus on reaching the goals that we're setting, not necessarily waking up dry every morning, but are you following the plan that we put in place to help you get there? And if you're making, you're, you're following the plan that we put into place, then that's something we should celebrate, that you're, you're trying your best. So drinking early mm -hmm. in the day, not drinking late at night, trying to, it's important for parents to understand that kids who wet the bed actually make a bigger amount, a bigger production. They have a higher urine production during the sleep cycle than the rest of us do. And kids in general are really good sleepers, so they're not waking up to the signal to go to the bathroom, not because they want to lay, they're, they're not laying awake and peeing the bed. They're not waking up to the full bladder signal. And, and the double whammy is they actually make more urine during the sleep cycle than the rest of us do. So when families understand that there's a physiologic um, uh, thing that's happening, that it isn't necessarily, um, a very small number of children might have some emotional um, component to bedwetting, but that, you know, that number is in very small proportion to the large number of perfectly normal kids who just make a, a, a large urine volume. Right, okay. Before we um, continue with Andrea and Carmel, I want to do some quick introductions behind the camera. We have Hannah Braun. She is behind the camera, literally. And then we have um, Aaron Rummel, who is fielding questions from the audience. So Aaron, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you for all who responded. We received over 114 questions with more coming in. Oh so we goodness. will try to answer more, <laughs> most questions. However, for those of you we don't reach, we will reply to, you, to your comment on the Facebook post. Uh, so far, the most common question asked, what steps can parents take to prevent bedwetting? So you mentioned maybe um, limiting the amount of fluids they have at night. Working on daytime habit is really daytime important. Habit. Working on fluids evaluating the um, bowel habits, um, making sure that, uh, uh, so there are two other strategies related to bedwetting alarms and medication that may or may not be utilized. Some primary care providers are very comfortable implementing those. Other primary care providers might want to, and pediatricians might want to um, make a referral if they decide that medication could be indicated and or um, the use of a bedwetting alarm. At what point should a parent start considering a specialist versus their pe their child's pediatrician for this issue? Um, well, I, you know, a lot of it, the conversation starts with their primary care provider because that's the person who sees the child on the well visits. Um, when the child and the parent can bring up the conversation and let them know that there's a concern about bedwetting or even daytime habit trouble that they're um, not able to remain dry during the day, um, a lot of times pediatricians or primary care providers are, are able to take those first steps and really get the family on the right track. Um, one of the things that Carmel and I have the privilege of doing in our clinic is that we have the time um, to spend with these families and really get to know them and really get to tease out all of the, you know, the social and the um, uh, other components to this that sometimes you don't have the um, ability to do in a, in a quicker visit. Uh, and by doing that, we can really focus our plans on the actual individual patient and um, you know, work that way. So we know, because we see so many of these kids, that their daytime habit is such a large influence that I think probably, I don't want to speak for Andrea, but I spend a lot of time talking yeah. about daytime habit. Yeah. And um, so getting in touch with the school, we have a, a letter that we prepare for the teacher so that we can enable the child to take, con to take control of their habit and to be in charge of their bathroom schedule, but to be allowed the freedom and autonomy in the classroom to be able to use the, the bathroom. And you, um, as all of us know, depending on it, the, the number of kids in class, and the temperament of all the children in class and the temperament of the teacher, sometimes it can be a burden for teachers to have to manage some, everybody's bathroom schedule. So they can become a little bit rigid about when children can use the bathroom. And so working through those details with kids and giving them um, some ability to, uh, to 
uh, be able to communicate with their teacher about the bathroom schedule is really very helpful. It really frees them up to not feel like it's a secret. Right. Do you have any other questions? Sure. Talana from Baltimore writes that her nine-year-old and six-year-old wets the bed. Is this because they were potty trained too early? Um, I don't think potty training too early necessarily is the cause of any bed wetting. Like we said, it can be very normal. Um, sometimes kids that potty train at a really early age develop some habits that tend to make them over control their bladder and hold their urine for a really long time. And when that happens, it sort of starts the cycle of these daytime habit issues that we were referring to before, that maybe they're not using the bathroom as often as they really need to, and we need to get them on a more scheduled basis to empty their bladder so that that can help improve their nighttime wetting. What's the typical age for potty training? Is it different for boys and girls? So I'm the mother of girls, and Andrea is the mother of boys, and I think we would all agree that girls seem to be a little bit easier than boys. Um, I can honestly tell you that both of my children um, potty trained themselves. Um, I'm not so sure that I think boys could be a little more of a challenge. Right. Um, but the typical age to, 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 to ready a child, um, and again, I am of the philosophy that children tell you when they're ready to go on the potty. Mm -hmm. um, so between two and a half and four, most kids are dry during the day. And again, I have to tell you that um, most children will tell you when they're ready to wear big, wear big girl pants and, and the job is done if you allow them to have the control. And so um, it's, it's not always easy. And some, some take a little more work mm -hmm. than others. Let's go, one more question. So Nicole from Baltimore writes, is, um, does AD, I'm sorry, Jennifer from Pennsylvania writes, does ADHD contribute to bedwetting? ADHD contributes to daytime habit dysfunction, and so daytime habit dysfunction contributes to bedwetting. So in and of itself, bedwetting is not connected to ADHD. I spent a lot of time looking at children with daytime wetting habit um, in part, part of my studies um, for this specialty. and. I found that in the population we studied, we went back and looked retrospectively, 50% um, of boys and 50% of girls in our population had daytime habit problems. And of that population, um, the boys tended to have ADHD more frequently than girls, and they were the boys who had problems with um, habit during the day because they um, are very easily distracted on their way to the bathroom. Going back just for a second to sleepovers, how can parents talk with the parents of their friend whose house they are sleeping over at to um, kind of explain the situation, make everyone feel more comfortable, and do you think that the friends should be in on the secret, or is that something that they should keep private? That's really going to be personal choice on and whether or not you're going to share this information with the children. Um, I think what will happen um, more often than not is that it's going to be a private conversation between the parents. And surprisingly, I think what you'll what they'll learn is that their the response might actually be, oh, Johnny wears pull-ups to bed also, you know. And so it's just something that we keep private because we don't want to put all that information out there. But it's really not that uncommon of a problem. A lot of times, children can deal with that by the the parent can discreetly bring them to another room and put on the pull-up for them, and then it's taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, but it really depends on what the parent and child are comfortable yeah, with. It's tricky. It's not, yeah. uh, you know, it's very dependent on the relationship of the moms or the relationship between um, the kids and the temperament of the children. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to preserve the integrity and of the, of the child who's wedding, right? right? Because if they're ashamed at all or embarrassed by their friends, that, that will really undermine anybody's efforts to be positive. So I think it's a tricky conversation, and I sympathize with moms who are a little bit worried about it. Um, we, I had a patient recently whose, un whose, whose uncle wanted to have the opportunity to take care of him over the weekend, and the mom was worried about it. She wasn't his biological sibling. So when she explained what her worry was, because he was offended that he wasn't given the opportunity to have this experience with his nephew, she explained why, and he said, oh, it's no problem. I went to bed until I was 12 years old. Mm. So there was the family history, right? right? And so that made her so relieved, and he actually has been quite a support for the young boy who um, we were able to help him with a little bit of medicine. So that's kind of the careful dialogue that has to happen. Do children ever regress? So they'll wet the bed, they'll stop wetting, and then all of a sudden, it could be months or even maybe a year or more, and they start all of a sudden wetting the bed again. Um, the, the population that I see that has the most trouble with regression, because mo most often, no, they don't. Um, but the ones that have a lot of daytime habit disturbances or constipation issues, um, when, when they fall back into old habits, 
or you know something dramatically changes in their schedule or social situation that sort of sets them into that cycle again of, of not doing what their plan entails. Um, those are the ones that we see, and it's sort of a red flag to say, huh, what's going on? Something's a little different now. It's very frequent that early kids who have recently been toilet trained who have a new addition in the family um, or a psychosocial change that's very yeah. critical to them can have a relapse or a regression, as you're calling it. Um, you know, the, uh, sometimes that, that's not so unusual, right? So if you're two and a half or three years old, there's been a rush to potty train because the, new, this, the, the next <laughs> family member is going to join the family. Um, and then the new baby comes and there's a little bit of regression. That's very common, and most people are prepared for that, actually. Erin, let's go another question from the audience. So Kelly writes in with two questions. The first, should we wake up our children to use mm -hmm. the bathroom several times a night, Great or question. should we deal with the, the, question, uh, the consequences? Great. So um, I am. Uh, I think most most people who take care of children would agree that sleep is really important, and it would not be a recommendation of mine to wake up, or f frankly, parents' sleep is really important. <laughs> so um, everyone should sleep. So I don't think, we don't recommend particularly that it's a great idea for um, people to wake up their children. Now, there are several homes where there are older folks who live with um, younger children, grandmoms who don't go to sleep often, and so I have a large population of patients who, who um, when they are up, they get their child up to go to the bathroom, or before they go to bed, they get one a child up to go. I think that's most effective with older kids who mm -hmm. are still wetting, but little guys between four and t 10, um, I think it's much more important that they get a good night's sleep. And most people, I think, will tell you when they've brought their child to the bathroom in the middle of the night, the child's really not even waking up exactly. because they sleep so soundly. Right. So they're just going through the motions of emptying the bladder, and sometimes they'll use wet the bed after that, or sometimes they've missed it and they've wet the bed before that. Mm -hmm. And that's very different from the the way that a bedwetting alarm would work, and that's just a, a whole different process of um, catching you right in that moment where mm -hmm. the urine is being training the brain. Exactly, exactly. So that's a very different concept than just randomly waking them up at certain times. Do you find that the bedwetting alarms are effective, in your opinion? They can be. They certainly can be, but it is um, a sort of a family uh, decision to mm -hmm. use the alarm because it's a very loud alarm that will wake the family. Oh, wow. Um, and it takes time. It just takes time, and so if you have a family that's committed to that and they're they're willing to do that, they can be very effective. Do you have another question? Yes. Um, Amanda writes: Is there a correlation with my nine-year-old sensitivity to dairy and gluten? So does diet play a part in bedwetting? I, you know, I think right off the bat, my instinct would say that perhaps that's related more to how their bowel is functioning, and if something's not working properly, if they have issues with constipation or something of that nature related to their diet, that perhaps that's the component of bedwetting that, that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's lots of things um, that as we read and become more knowledgeable about the effects of processed foods and gluten and dairy, um, we certainly could, could suggest that um, we, we could all do better with regard to what we're putting in our mouths, but there is no evidence to suggest that those things are linked to aneurysis. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's, you know, that there isn't any scientific literature that would support that. But, you know, I know, um, I, d I don't think that there's any harm in limiting or restricting or looking at the, the, um, the healthy way in which we feed our kids and, and trying to um, assure that we do our best job at that. Um, but there isn't really any cause and effect um, literature that's been, or research that's been done to link those. Just a quick reminder that if you're watching this video right now, please be sure to like it and like our page as well. You can continue to leave your questions for Carmel and Andrea in the comments below this post. Let's take one more question. Uh, Laura from Baltimore writes that her child is a 12-year-old with high-functioning autism. We will get a, uh, they will get him up at night, but he still wets the bed. What is the recommendation? Well, first of all, I, I would congratulate and commend all of the moms who have, uh, and families who have um, challenges with kids with autism because they, they really do a great job. And we see lots of those, pa those children in our practice. Um, and um, the decision to, to whether or not to offer some medication by age 12 would be one that we could, that we might offer. Certainly keeping kids in their right habit is important. Um, 
and, and knowing exactly what, what the rest of the story looks like. So it's really important when we're having kids that are complicated that we have the opportunity to do a complete assessment, yeah. right? So what can parents um, do for our viewers who are still concerned about their child's bedwetting, even after listening to this video um, and possibly doing their own research, looking at our website, et cetera, and they still have concerns? What can parents do? What do you suggest for them? Uh, the first thing is to start the conversation with their primary care provider, um, because certainly they're the, the hub of the care. And then from there, um, if they're not um, able to help them or start them on the right track or continue their care, certainly calling us, making an appointment to see one of us, we'd be happy to do that. Um, we have clinics several times a week in a couple of different locations. Um, our phone number is 410-328-5730, um, or on our website, umm.edu slash children's. Um, so certainly we can you know, offer our support. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is when you come to the appointments, the more information you have for us, the more helpful we can be right off the bat. You know, pay attention. When our, when our kids are, you know, 8, 9, 10 years old, they're pretty independent with their bathroom habits, and sometimes we just don't know the answers to the questions, like, are you having a bowel movement every day, and how often do you go to the bathroom when you're at school? So if you can gather some of this information before you get to see us, then that's even more helpful to us. Does it make a difference what time of night the bedwetting starts? Should they keep any sort of sleep diary or anything like that to bring to the appointment so you can better judge what might be happening? Well, I, you know, it's important. I, we're pretty good his, We're pretty good <laughs> detectives, and our patients, I, I really like to develop great relationships yeah. with the kids because they come with their heads hanging down, very nervous that they're going to have to talk about a problem. And so I really do like to spend a little time with eye contact and get them to start to be the people in charge of the problem. Um, and really, when they develop that ability, first of all, when you listen to them and they tell you their story, they're very, they get a sense of validation that, they're, that someone is listening. So, so I really enjoy that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't necessarily think they need to understand the nighttime. There's just a few rules that they need to understand around, um, you know, I tell them we only have a couple rules, and those are not to be awake in a pull-up and um, to be in charge and, and to, be able to be honest. And so that so then we usually make some strides after that. I like to tell my patients that if they were the only person with this problem, I wouldn't have a job. Well, that's right. 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 <laughs> that's so exactly right. It makes right. me feel a little better. Right. I think we have one more question. Um, Lisa writes: Are there any techniques to help convince a child to urinate before bed, even if they say they don't have to go? They have to go at the time to help prevent nighttime wetting. All kids say they don't have to go. If you ask somebody, do you have to go to the bathroom, all of us would say, I don't have to go. So that's really, um, so, so I like to tell them that everybody has to try. So we, every two hours you have to try. And even if, at most of the time, when we try to go to the bathroom, um, usually just the act of sitting or the act of trying to go will initiate the urine stream. So, and the empty bladder. So um, I like to reframe. It's not time, do, not do you have to go to the bathroom, but it's time to try. We're also um, big fans of reward charts and you know, keeping track of you get a star when you try. Um, and that way, once they've built up the number of however many they need to in the week, then they get an extra book with mom or dad over the weekend or some extra special playtime. It doesn't have to be a financial reward or a big prize present at the end, but yeah. Okay, great. That's all the time we have today. You can continue to leave your questions for Carmel and Andrea in the comments below, and they'll get back to you within 48 hours. Thank you so much for watching us. Take care.